We are now moving to the description of the material point. Remember that the material point is one of the most intuitive mechanical systems. It's a system that is described by position and momentum. And for this chapter, we're going to focus on material point in one dimension. Therefore, both position and momentum will be just one real number. Now, how do we describe a system whose variables are something like position, that has a continuous number of values instead of a discrete one? Well, for discrete systems, we had this description, right? We had that the state was written like this, and these coefficients had to be normalized to one. Here, we're going to have the analog of that for continuous variables. So instead of a sum, we're going to have an integral. And similar as before, these psi of x now plays the role of the ck before. And here, the normalization will look like this. Now, because this condition must be satisfied, in particular, this function psi of x, the integral well, must be 1. In particular, should not be infinity. So some functions like psi of x equal to x squared would not comply with that. The function must decrease at infinity. These functions that decrease at infinity, such that this integral is 1, is normalizable, are the functions that will describe proper quantum states. So the Hilbert space, the vector space we're going to describe, uh, we're going to use to describe the system, is the space of square integrable functions, which again means the function such that their integral is not infinity. There is a scalar product on this vector space that is defined like that. Again, it's very similar to what we had for discrete variables. Now, there's an object that I've introduced here that I have to discuss, which is this x here, this kind of basis in which we decompose this state. What is it? Well, it behaves most of the time very well. For instance, it is true that the projection on psi on that object is actually the wave function, as you would expect from here. The projection of these on these element is the coefficient in front of it. However, if you apply the same rule to that vector itself, you would find that the wave function is a delta function. Now, a delta function is not square integral. The integral of square of a delta is infinity. Therefore, strictly speaking, these objects, these x, are not proper vectors. However, they are useful in the notation, they are useful in the mathematics, and they really behave very well. So they can be used, uh, and we are going to use them. After speaking about the description of the states, once again, we have to describe the operators that describe the physical quantities. So for the material point, as you can expect, there are two main operators. All the others depend on those two, position and momentum. They can be written like this. Position, there is the value of the position, the projector or pseudo projector on the state being in that position and integration over x. Momentum, the same. Now, as long as I write these two like this, there's no difference. Uh, both could be position. They could be position of two different particles. So I have to specify something, a relation between the two of them, so that this is the momentum as, uh, co conjugated to that position. That relation is this commutation relation. So any two operators, x and p, that satisfy this commutation relation can be written like these, and they will play the role of position and momentum, respectively. This famous commutation relation is the one in particular that gives rise to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, delta x, delta p, larger than h bar over 2. Now, let's see how these operators act on states. The position operator acts on a state by just multiplying the wave function by x. So you see that here now, this is the action of the position operator on psi of x is multiplied by x. The action of the momentum operator on psi of x is very different. It's not a multiplication, it's a derivative. This is the action of the momentum operator on psi of x. From these two, various consequences will follow that we'll see in the course. I just highlight two of them here that are very important to remember. One is that the, the uh, psi of x from here and from here 
plays the role, psi of x squared plays the role of probability densities, the, the, the density of probability of finding the particle at position x, which means that the probability of finding the particle between position A and position B in that interval is the integral of psi x squared dx between A and B. Another thing I want to highlight is what are the eigenstates of momentum that are introduced here, or pseudo eigenstates of momentum? Well, again, there are non-normalizable functions, like for positions, so they are not proper vectors, but their wave function is, in this case, a plane wave, uh, with a wave vector defined essentially by the momentum that is described. Just as we did for chapter three, we have the description of the states, the description of the operators, and then next we have to check the dynamics, the evolution in time. For material points, the form of the Hamiltonian is fixed. Is P squared over 2M, kinetic energy, plus potential energy that depends only on position. This one, of course, may be different functions, and the different case studies we're going to see are case studies where this function varies. We are going to have to solve the eigenvalue equation, that is, what are the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian? This is the, in the abstract uh, algebraic formulation. If you go to the wave function representation, this equation looks like this. You see that it's a second order differential equation in x. And this is not always easy to solve, and that's why the Schrodinger equation for material points in general cannot be solved. In this chapter, we're going to see essentially three uh, types of case studies. The first one is very simple, is the free particle, where there is no potential, only kinetic energy. In this case, we know from classical physics what should happen, namely that the particle is free and it moves at constant speed. Indeed, this is something what is, that is found also in, for, the for the quantum version of, the, uh, of this problem. The average position changes in time linearly with the speed. However, there is a difference. The spread of the wave function, so the, yeah, the spread of in position, varies. For instance, it may increase. The particles may get delocalized. The second series of case studies I will devote quite some time to, because they are very uh, canonically solved and they give interesting insights, are the piecewise constant potentials. For instance, a potential that is like a well, so constant here, constant here, constant here, or the opposite, a step, a barrier or a step. Here, these are toy models for important phenomena that happen usually, of course, in 3D. This is a toy model of an atom where the, uh, the, the bound states are discrete and then the radiation states are continuous. This is a toy model for the tunneling effect, the fact that sometimes quantum particles even if they wouldn't have the classical energy to overcome a barrier, may be found on the other side. And this one is a canonical example for scattering, when suddenly there's a change in potential and there is some possible reflection at the boundary. The third case study we're going to make, which is by far the most important, is the harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator is given by a quadratic potential in x. So you see that the Hamiltonian is going to be essentially p squared plus x squared, and this quadratic form has very nice properties. And here is the harmonic oscillator we just described. I have to go a little bit more in detail in this chapter about this very important example, which is again written here, p squared over 2m plus a quadratic potential, a parabola. It's kind of clear what kind of physical system may be described by these, a trapped particle, in a, trapped in a potential that looks like these. But actually, every system that has a proper frequency is described by harmonic oscillator. For instance, in your future career when you're going to do quantum optics or quantum electrodynamics, you will find that the electromagnetic field that has all these frequencies in the light, each frequency is described by harmonic oscillator. So it's a really uh, very widespread example. Now, we are going to solve the eigenvalue equation using the method invented by Dirac, who noticed that this Hamiltonian can also be written in this form, where this A operator is something up to some constants that you find in the lecture notes, is something like position plus imaginary number times momentum. And when you do this change of variables, again, with some clever algebra, you can find that the eigenvalues of this object, A dagger A, are all the natural numbers, so positive integers or, or zero. 
Therefore, the eigenvalues of h are going to be h bar omega n plus 1 half. This means that these eigenvalues can be represented like this. Well, this spacing is h bar omega over 2. And then all the levels here are going to be spaced by h bar omega. So all the levels equally spaced, but the ground state being not at 0, but already a little bit displaced. What are the eigenvectors, the wave functions of associated to these eigenvalues? Well, they are given by this formula, where this object is a polynomial of degree n. So in a pictorial representation, they look more or less like this. The first one is a polynomial degree 0, is a Gaussian. Second one is a polynomial degree 1 times a Gaussian, so it's something like this. The third one is something like that, and so on. A very important thing to keep in mind is that these number states, the states of well-defined energy, are stationary states. They are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Therefore, for every energy level, it will be the case that the position and the momentum do not change in time. They are stationary states. Now, this is highly non-classical. In classical physics, the only state of the harmonic oscillator that does not change in time is the state that is sitting here, not moving, with zero velocity. Here we see that we have infinitely many states that don't move. They are really non-classical objects, in spite of the classical interpretation that they have states of given energy. The states whose dynamics looks closest to the classical states are called coherent states. They look like this, very complicated superposition of all the number states. And we're going to study them also in detail. This will be the content of chapter 4. And in chapter 5, we're going to move to the particle in 3D.